there's this punk guy. Thinks he can steal from Uncle Paul and live to talk about it. He's at the club. When you see him, take back what belongs to the sun on ye triad. And way. Make an example of him. The dragon head will want to meet you. Looks like you're moving up in the world. When it comes to gaming, I find it tragic when an excellent game is released and ends up being overlooked or forgotten for whatever reason. Take Titanfall 2 for instance, an incredible game with one of the best single player campaigns I've ever played. EA however sent it out to die by releasing it in between Battlefield 1 and Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. This move killed any attention the game would have received, hurt its sales, and eventually led to EA acquiring its developer Respawn who would go on to make Apex Legends instead of a proper Titanfall 3. Yes, I'm still salty about this. Then there's the odd case of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, developed by Eidos Montreal. It received excellent reviews and had a good launch window, but it was overlooked by the gaming public because Marvel's Avengers wasn't a good game. Since both games looked superficially similar and were published by Square Enix, most assumed Guardians was going to play the same and be of similar quality so the game ended up underperforming sales-wise. I might actually do a video on that game in the future, because it really does deserve more attention. And finally, that brings me to the topic of today's video, Sleeping Dogs. Ever since I covered True Crime Streets of LA last December, I've been dying to talk about this game. I was going to cover Streets of New York first, but admittedly I'm not all that interested in that game. There's this misconception that the game was always meant to be the third entry in the True Crime series, but that's not exactly true. Sleeping Dogs originally began development as a game called Black Lotus, which would have starred an Asian female assassin modeled after Lucy Liu. Initially pitched by Treyarch, one of the co-developers of the Call of Duty franchise, it was going to be published by Activision until they put a halt on the production. After some renewed interest in wanting their own GTA-like series, the game would be renamed True Crime Hong Kong, would now star a male lead, and developing duties would be handed off to United Front Games. Due to over-budgeting and delays, the game would be cancelled again before Square Enix stepped in and bought the publishing rights from Activision. Since they didn't own the IP rights to True Crime, the game would be renamed one more time and become Sleeping Dogs. It would debut to stellar reviews from gaming publications, and sell a respectable 1.5 million copies within two months of release. Not exactly GTA numbers, but still a solid debut for a brand new IP, especially back in 2012. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to guarantee it a sequel. Due to Sleeping Dogs, the Tomb Raider reboot, and Hitman Absolution all underperforming, and selling below Square Enix's sales projections, they axed any plans for a sequel. Though we do have an idea of what that sequel could have been. In an article written by Patrick Klepek for Vice, he went over the details of a design document for Sleeping Dogs 2 shared by a former developer at United Front Games. We would have returned to playing as Wei Shen, He'd now be working with a corrupt cop as a partner, it would take place in a brand new Chinese city, and on top of expanding the scope of the game, it would also feature the option for co-op. There's a lot more that was revealed in that design doc, so I encourage you guys to give it a read when you get a chance, I'll link it in the description down below. There was a shred of hope for more sleeping dogs though, as Square Enix put United Front Games to work developing an online multiplayer game set in the game's version of Hong Kong, a game called Triad Wars. It looked like it may have been the company's attempt at GTA Online, but after an announcement trailer and closed beta test, that project would get cancelled too. And unfortunately, United Front Games would close their studio in 2016. With that, Sleeping Dogs as a series was effectively dead. It's not even clear who owns the IP rights right now, as it wasn't listed publicly as one of the IPs Square Enix sold to Embracer Group, so either one of the publishers might own it now. All these factors make Sleeping Dogs such a tragic game in my eyes. To see what I consider a masterpiece of a game become a flash in the pan that didn't become the next big gaming series seriously sucks. It knocked it out of the park in its debut, with a gorgeous take on Hong Kong, solid gameplay mechanics, a complex and interesting protagonist, and a great story that pays homage to cop and martial arts films. While it lacks the scope and size of GTA V, I consider Sleeping Dogs the superior game. Don't know if that's really a hot take or not, seems opinions about GTA V are all over the place nowadays. 
you can watch mine in this 4 hour video here. So join me as I dive into Hong Kong's criminal underworld and discuss a game so good I'd go as far as calling it a masterpiece, and one that never got the glory it deserved. Oh, before I do, depending on when this video drops, video game holiday sales should still be going on, which means you can buy this game and all its DLC for as low as $3 on Steam, or $5 on consoles. Do yourself a favor and absolutely buy it, as even if you don't end up liking the game as much as I do, for those prices and what's included, it's an absolute steal. And I'm doing a longer outro than usual this time around, as I'm using it as a sorta end of the year wrap up for the channel. So stick around to the end if you want to know my plans for 2024. He's only. I'm not fucking blind. Relax, old boy. We're on the same side, remember? To the other gate, you know. Hey, you more for? Yeah, you got the money? The game kicks off with our protagonist, Wei Shen, and his buddy Naz facilitating a drug deal with a local buyer. Things go south almost immediately when a security guard stumbles onto the deal, and the buyer freaks the fuck out and starts hacking the poor guy to pieces. The police watching the deal will spring into action to arrest everyone, Naz and Wei taking off and leading us into the game's first tutorial, Parkour. Several segments throughout the game will have you running away from or trying to chase after someone, with Wei sprinting non-stop throughout the streets or inside a building, leaping over obstacles, climbing up walls, and leaping over large gaps. It's not quite as in-depth as the parkour in Assassin's Creed, but it gets the job done, and it doesn't feel janky like the chase sequences in Yakuza. The game's verticality does add more to the exploration elements of Hong Kong, as several hidden collectibles need you to scale areas in order to reach them. Despite his best efforts, Wei is unable to shake the cops and runs right into an ambush. Uh, Wei Shen? It's Jackie from All Prosperity, man. <sighs> oh shit, Jackie Ma. It is you. I can't fucking believe it. What are you doing here? When did you get back? <laughs> While sitting in his jail cell, no doubt stressing the life sentence he's going to get for dealing drugs, Wei bumps into his childhood friend, Jackie Ma. The two grew up together in old prosperity projects in Hong Kong, before Wei's family left to live in America. Jackie catches him up on what he's been up to, now working for another friend of theirs by the name of Winston Chu. Winston is the leader of the Water Street Gang, and is now a Red Pole, a high-ranking member of the Sinan Yi triad his gang is a part of. As Jackie is set free, he tells Wei to hit him up when he gets out of jail and that they may be able to get him a job doing some work for Winston. Though it's probably going to be a long, long time until Wei does get out. It seems that the evidence against you has failed to appear. How do you explain that? You must be a very dangerous man, Wei Shen. That is exactly what we want people to think. I trust that my men weren't too rough on you, officer. You might ask them the same question, sir. Those guys are out of shape. It paid off, though. I made contact with Jackie Ma. Surprise! Turns out Wei was actually an undercover cop this whole time. Though, considering the game's marketing and the back of the box already gave that away, I wonder why the devs bothered to try and hide it in the opening. Our protagonist, Wei Shen, is a Hong Kong native and recently transferred to the Hong Kong Police Department after several years of working for the San Francisco Police Department. Due to him being raised in both locations, Wei had a good understanding of both cultures, making him uniquely suitable for doing undercover work and infiltrating Asian-led gangs. While he's mostly a by-the-book cop, he developed a reputation for getting violent with suspects, and after his sister Mimi died of a drug overdose, became motivated by vengeance to take down the gang that supplied her the drugs. This caught the attention of Thomas Pendrew, who recruited Wei into his plan to infiltrate and take down the Sinan Yi. I'm going to hold off on discussing his character for now, as I want to wait for certain story beats to happen first. Wei is voiced by Will Yun Lee, who has a pretty long career across TV, movies, and games. You most likely know him from Altered Carbon, Hawaii 5 or working alongside Johnny Gad on The Good Doctor. 
Meanwhile, Wei Superior Pendru is played by Tom Wilkinson, who also has a long worksheet. But I remember him as Carmine Falcone in Batman Begins, and as Thomas Griffith in the first Rush Hour movie. Remember this for later. Now that Wei has an option to get in with the Sun on Yi, thanks to his buddy Jackie, he's been tasked with getting close to Winston Chu and collecting as much information as he can on the triad. His handler on this case is Chief Inspector Raymond Mock, who's voiced by Brian Mann. You know, Ryu in Street Fighter the movie. And I'm going to kick that son of a bitch Bison's ass so hard that the next Bison wannabe is gonna feel it. I don't care what anyone says, this movie is a damn masterpiece. Like Grand Theft Auto before it, Sleeping Dogs has quite the cast of experienced actors voicing characters in this game. And like I usually do, I won't bring up every single one of them, but I will mention the ones I recognize every now and then throughout the video. Raymond has reservations about Wei's ability to do his job, believing his violent nature and vendetta against the gangs he took down previously would make him a liability in this case. Pendrew isn't worried though, insisting that Wei is the perfect man for the job. Now that we know the plan, it's time to hit up our buddy Jackie. Wei Shen? Man, this is going to be great. Yeah, thanks again, Jackie. I appreciate the intro. No problem, man. By the way, you know I tried looking you up a few years back, but I couldn't find shit. Do they have internet in America? <laughs> I think they're getting it next year. I guess you were in prison or something. Jackie sits at the bottom of the hierarchy when it comes to the Sun on Yi and Winston's group, the Water Street Gang. Technically speaking, the kid is more of an associate and not an actual proper member of the gang when you first meet him. While he's ambitious and eager to prove what he's capable of, Jackie is held back due to being a bit dumb and not fully thinking through the schemes he cooks up. He effectively serves as Wei's surrogate little brother slash sidekick throughout the game, Jackie looking up to his former friend due to his capabilities and the fact he's the only one who treats him with respect. As the game goes on, he'll slowly grow more confident and capable due to Wei's influence, slowly winning over the other gang members. He reminds me a lot of Shinji from Yakuza, or Rikia from Yakuza 3, with just a smidge of Jesse Pinkman. As they walk through the streets, Jackie will inform Wei of how Winston now controls the night market, but is constantly pushing back against his former friend, Dog Eyes. Now a Red Pole himself, he's gotten greedy and has been trying to take Winston's territory. He's also another person they all grew up with, though Wei has a less than savory history with Dog Eyes. Jackie also lets slip that the Sunon Yi are extremely wary of new faces at the moment, as they recently discovered that there was an undercover cop in their midst, said cop met a very long and painful death at the hands of the triad. A fate Wei himself can look forward to if he ends up blowing this job. Once Jackie finishes catching us up, our little buddy will stop to talk to his sweetheart, Ju Mei, and will need some help defending her honor once some assholes show up to start shit. Get off him, I don't care who you are, let go of Jackie, I'm gonna fuck him up! Time for the combat tutorial. Sleeping Dog's melee is your standard beat em up affair, making use of different light and heavy attacks to pull off different combo moves. You know, I've heard a lot of people compare Sleeping Dog's combat to the fighting system in Rocksteady's Arkham series, and that's not really the case. On the surface, it may look similar, but once you start a fight, you'll see there's this constant flow to combat, with Batman effortlessly moving between enemies, moving faster and hitting harder the longer his combo goes on. You have different takedown options that can remove multiple enemies from a fight, and to keep it from mashing one button over and over, you need to be on top of countering enemies or stunning others in order to open them up for attacks. Sleeping Dogs by comparison is a lot slower and simpler, being closer to the Yakuza games in terms of enemy encounters. Outside of using combo moves to trade blows with whoever you're fighting, or attacking them with various melee weapons you can find, you have the option to grapple them, which is the only way to break through guarding enemies. Once you got your hands on them, you can hold them in place to wail on their faces, toss them into another enemy, or run with them before smashing them into a wall or another object. Enemy attacks can be countered, rather easily actually, as they'll glow red as they're preparing to attack you, giving you a really generous window to block their move and hit them back. Though if you try to counter before they attack you, Wei will instead open himself up to be hit for a few seconds. Unlike the Arkham games, there isn't a large variety of enemy types that need different approaches to dealing with them. There are basically only two. First is the standard enemy type, and second is the big beefy boys who will soak up more hits and can't be grappled unless you stun them first. 
otherwise they'll grapple and slam you into the ground. While this ends up removing some strategy to fights, it leans more into being flashier and a bigger spectacle, similar to the martial arts films that inspired the game. Depending on where you're fighting, there'll be various environmental hazards you can take advantage of to quickly take someone out. You can drop a shutter on them, kick them into a phone booth, shred their face by shoving it into a fan, impale them on swordfish heads, and much, much more. They actually remind me a lot of the interrogation kills from the Punisher game. To keep it from being too button mashy, you can unlock better and more powerful combo moves that make crowd control easier, and let you hit multiple opponents at once. I'll circle back to the extra moves in a bit, as there's a few ways to unlock them. Overall, I find the combat fun and satisfying. It's not very challenging, but it never feels frustrating either. It can feel a bit repetitive, especially near the end game, but does its best to stay entertaining and not bore you. After taking care of those goons working for Dog Eyes, Jackie and Wei will head over to the Golden Koi, a restaurant owned by Winston's mother, and will meet the leader of the Water Street Gang. Oh, where the fuck do you think you're going? Relax, man. This is Wei. Wei Shen. I told you about him, remember? Fuck. We can't keep track of your bullshit friends, Jackie. No outsider. He's not an outsider. He's from old prosperity. Like us, Ho Chi all day, Jama. Wei is old school, you know? I grew up with the guy. Oh, prosperity, huh? I've been on vacation. You know, Jackie said you were looking for people. <laughs> oh, Jackie, bug, eh? No, 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 no. You should have seen it, Winston. We just beat up like 10 of Dog Eyes guys in the market by himself. Huh. Hi, man. Uh, they attacked us. Despite some pushback from another gang member named Conroy, Wei manages to impress Winston when he hears that he took out several of Dog Eye's guys. Winston will send him out to work with Conroy, while he has Jackie stay behind to learn more about their old buddy Wei. We'll have to go through a brief initiation that serves as a tutorial for countering before we're formally introduced to Dog Eyes. <laughs> and it was just getting interesting too. Winston, my old friend, so good to see you. How's your family, huh? What do you want, dog eyes? Oh, Winston, wait, wait, wait. Brother, I just came to talk to you, man. For old time's sake. Let's work something out here, okay? We can share the night market, huh? We're both Song Ong Yi, both grown men. We shouldn't be fighting like children. <laughs> hey, who's the new blood? It's Wei. You remember Mimi Shen? Back when you first started getting girls with Big Smiley. Oh, Mimi. Oh, yeah. First girl ever sucked my cock. <laughs> yeah, so what? Wei's her brother. And I was the first guy who ever stabbed you. You remember me now? Whoa, 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 Wei. What the fuck, man? Seriously, Wei. I apologize. I'm really sorry. Your sister blew me. <laughs> Welp. Can't wait to inevitably kill that guy. Props to Wei for managing to keep his composure. Dog Eyes is one of the more memorable characters from Sleeping Dogs. He's not your typical power-hungry and ruthless criminal. More a slimy and smug piece of shit. He never misses a moment to run his mouth, especially to Wei, constantly throwing jabs at his dead sister. Which cuts even deeper, as Dog Eyes was the one who got Mimi addicted to drugs in the first place. Which led Wei's family to leave for America in order to help her get clean. While initially presented as a smug snake who avoids direct confrontation and uses dirty tactics to muscle in on Winston's turf, later events of the game will show there's no limit to how low he'll sink to get what he wants. After he leaves, Winston will order Wei and Jackie to go around the night market to collect protection money and remind everyone who really owns this territory. But first, I'm a bit parched. Time for a delicious Dragon Kick energy drink. Now you got a sale. Dotted around the map are various food and drink vendors you can visit to get something to eat, which will heal Wei and also give him a temporary buff, like increasing his attack, defense, or how fast his health regenerates. Oh, and they all stack on top of each other too. Since they're relatively cheap to buy and easy to get to, it's worth dining before getting into an encounter, making that already easy combat that much easier. Also, never forget, a man who never eats pork bun is never a whole man. After extorting the local businesses for protection money, and getting into another fight with Dog Eyes crew, 
Wei will have completed the first step in earning Winston's trust. As the mission completes, we're given the option of buying new clothes for Wei. Outside of trying to make him look stylish, with unlockable costumes that make Wei look like Agent 47, or Adam Jensen, or for some reason George St. Pierre, the right set of clothes will bestow various bonuses, like increasing your attack, defense, or increasing the amount of experience you gain. Which segues nicely into our next topic, Sleeping Dog's leveling system. At the end of each mission, depending on your actions, Wei will gain experience for his cop and triad score. Symbolized by three blue badges, his cop score starts off full at the beginning of a level, with Wei being penalized for when he does things like destroying public property, injuring civilians and fellow police, or biffing it when trying to climb or jump over something. While his triad score is symbolized by three red triangles, which starts empty at the beginning of a mission, and is filled by Wei doing hood shit like landing heavy attacks and combos, using environmental attacks, and straight up killing his enemies. Earn enough experience to level up your triad or cop level, and you'll get a skill point to spend for the respective skill trees. The cop skill tree offers upgrades that make police work easier, such as being able to instantly unlock cars with a Slim Jim, or making it easier to disarm suspects. The triad skill, on the other hand, will knock more moves to use, increase your melee damage, and decrease the damage you take from melee weapons. It's a much better implementation of True Crime's good cop, bad cop system, as it doesn't lock you into one play style and makes it worth it to behave more violently. Granted, it's a bit harder to keep your cop score maxed out during a mission, especially ones that involve driving, as it's close to impossible not to crash into another car or hit public property. But there are other ways to increase it that I'll talk about when they pop up in the story. There's also a third type of experience that can be earned, face XP. Colored yellow, you won't get this type of experience during main story missions, and is usually handed out by doing the side content, with the optional missions known as favors being the main source. Mark those little yellow speech bubbles on your map. Favors tend to vary in their length and objectives, which can be as simple as delivering food for someone, getting robbed after being tricked, and having to chase down the thief, or helping out various members of your crew by giving them a ride out of enemy territory, or helping them fight rival gangs. Increasing your face level will first unlock the face meter in combat, which will slowly fill up as you use combos to take out enemies. Once it's full and activated, Wei's health will start to regenerate and he'll be more intimidating, making enemies more likely to back away from him and stop attacking for a brief moment. From there, as you increase your face level, you unlock upgrades that improve the effects of foods and drink, allow Wei to disarm opponents when the face meter is activated, and a valet you can call to deliver your car wherever you are on the map. You can increase the amount of face XP you can earn using clothing accessories, and more expensive clothing and cars are locked until your face level is high enough. So it's worth engaging with the side content when you can in order to unlock those better face level bonuses, and especially the car valet. Swinging back to the main story, Winston has more work for us. A dealer by the name of Ming who he was offering protection to has stopped paying him and has switched sides to work with dog eyes. So he needs a way to find him and make an example of him. Finding Ming in the night market We'll chase him around for a bit before fighting him and his friends. Unfortunately, all the mayhem got the attention of the police, who bust away and lock him up again. Wei Sheng, I'm Inspector Tang. You have quite a rap sheet here. Multiple arrests in San Francisco, alleged ties to organized crime, and now you're here, enforcing for the Sun on Yi. This upstanding officer of the law is Inspector Tang who goes into the whole you need to do more with your life and stop being a criminal routine with Wei before Pendrew shows up and lets her know that he's an undercover officer. As your superior officer, I'm instructing you to release this man. But sir, I have it on record that he's son on Yi. I understand that. I can't simply just cut him loose. I mean, you're asking me to release a criminal with known connections to the triad, and not only is it against well, for protocol- for God's sake, Tang, he's one of us. What? Jesus, Pendrew, let me get the door. There are few badges outside who didn't hear you. It's all right, Wei, we can trust her. Trust her? I just met her. Congratulations, Tang, so now you know. Despite Wei's apprehension and letting too many people in the department know he's undercover, he'll warm up to Tang and offer to help with her work. Referred to as cop missions, these cases aren't part of the main story, but need to be completed to regress the game. You'll get four cases that unlock as you regress through the main story, each case made up of a few individual missions. Since it can be tough to keep your cop score maxed out when doing work for the Sun on Yi, these cases, along with smaller cop jobs, work to earn more police XP, along with unlocking some new clothes and cars for completing them. Our first case with Inspector Tang has Wei assisting in taking down a big drug dealer by the name of Popstar. Wei will make contact with Popstar after getting his location from that other guy, Ming, 
Afterwards, getting in his good graces by getting back some money owed to him. The next lead in the case works as the tutorial for the drug bust side mission, where Wei will go into a given area, beat up the local gang, and then hack a security camera. Then you'll head back to his apartment where you can use his TV to check surveillance and bust the gang in the act of buying drugs. Not 100% sure how legal any of that is, but I'm not well informed about Hong Kong law enforcement. The final lead in the Popstar case will unlock when you complete another drug bust. You'll tail Popstar using a chicken van and then covertly photograph him making a deal and killing his buyer. The evidence enough to lock him up for good. It'll be a while to the next police case. So for now, it's back to working with Winston and the Sun on Yi. Meeting up with Jackie, he tells us about a shipment of illegal goods that Dog Eyes is going to receive. Wei sees this as their chance to start moving up in the ranks faster. So they decide to steal the goods and give Winston a cut. Heading down to the docks, the boys will jump Dog Eyes goons before they have to chase after them in the van carrying the goods. Guess now's as good a time as ever to talk about the driving and sleeping dogs. It's fine. Cars handle well and I don't have much trouble making corners. Braking feels a little weird though as the car tends to slide for a little bit when trying to make a complete stop. Also, getting onto a motorcycle can feel annoying, as Wei has an unskippable animation he does every single time he starts a bike. Not a big deal outside of missions, but in ones where you have to chase after someone, it can be frustrating to have to wait a few seconds before you can actually follow them. Driving in this game does have some unique elements to it. For one, you can manually smash into other cars, letting you damage them enough until the car is completely disabled. The other option is what the game refers to as action hijacks, where you have to get close to another car, hold down the button so Wei can hang out of his car, and once you see the green arrow, press the button again so Wei can fling himself onto the other car. Wei will then position himself over the driver's side of the car, yank them out, and take over the ride. It can be tricky to pull off if there's too much traffic, mainly as you might accidentally jump onto the wrong car, but otherwise, it's a fun little mechanic. It can end chase sequences faster and without causing too much collateral damage. After grabbing the goods and finding out they were just knockoff watches, we'll drop Jackie off near a warehouse where he'll sell them off to a contact of his. Oh well, gotta start somewhere when it comes to selling illegal goods, right? After heading back to his apartment for a good night's sleep, the following day a striking young lady will catch Wei's eye as he leaves his place. Excuse me, do you speak English? I like to think so. Not enough to get by anyways. You? Yeah, I... Wait, what do you mean? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I speak English. I kind of guessed. What can I do for you? Amanda here is the first of several ladies that Wake can date after meeting them. She's also voiced by Emma Stone of all people. I'm going to swing back to how girlfriends will work in this game in just a sec. But first, I want to go over some other things introduced in this mission. First is the game's collectibles, which most players probably would have discovered before this point. Scattered around Hong Kong, you can find health statues that Wei can pray at, which will increase his maximum health when he prays at four of them, and later five as his health increases. Next, we got lockboxes that carry a decent amount of cash and sometimes unlock a piece of clothing for Wei. The security cameras used for drug busts are also considered collectibles. Also, there's a DLC pack that adds red envelopes into the game that would give you even more cash though it's included by default in the definitive edition of the game. The locations of those envelopes are now randomized though. While not marked on your map, not initially at least, they're usually pretty easy to spot as they'll flash light when you pass by one. Which brings us to the last collectible, the 12 G Chinese Zodiac statues, which are tied to the martial arts school, which is run by Wei's former master, Sifu. Can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to sign up for some Kung Fu classes. I read about your school in my guidebook. Ah, uh, your guidebook. Yeah, it said you teach a style with a long lineage, but in spite of all that, it's still considered very effective. You want to take classes, okay. And you, did you also read about this place in some book? Well, I... Uh... Wait. I know you. Yes, Sifu Kwok. I used to be your student. I'm Wei. Wei Shen. Ah, yes. The one who went to America. So you brought this girl back with you. Uh, your skill level with girls, very good. Now time to assess your skill level in Kung Fu. I love how Sifu pulls a 180 from being rude to Amanda at first because she's a tourist, 
to praising Wei's game when he thinks he wiped her up in America. His martial arts school is where Wei can unlock his extra combo attacks, starting off with the directional strike, where he can attack in the opposite direction he's facing. Before Wei can continue his training, he needs to track down the Jade statue stolen from Sifu's dojo, who will then teach him a new move for each one he brings. The statues are hidden around the map with a few of them only appearing in mission-specific locations, but don't worry, these statues aren't permanently missable. Though how you could miss them is beyond me, as the game will always put them in your direct path during those segments. But if you blow it, you can replay the mission from the score screen in order to get the Jade statues. This does mean the better and stronger moves are locked until you get much farther into the game. You unlock finishing moves that hit multiple enemies, the ability to break a guy's arm or instantly stun them, with the final ability being a powerful counterattack in the form of the Dim Mach. What the hell is a Dim Mach? Death touch. Bloodsport is also a masterpiece of cinema, and I will hear no arguments to the contrary. While some of the extra moves can feel a bit like overkill during regular enemy encounters, they do even the odds and give you a fighting chance if you participate in the optional martial arts clubs dotted on the map. After Wei's unofficial first date with Amanda goes well, he'll get her number and can call her up for another date. Girlfriends and sleeping dogs feel very underutilized if I'm being honest. Each encounter with one of them is more or less the same, as you'll bump into one of the girls during a story mission, get their number afterwards, and can call them for an optional date. The date themselves vary but are extremely basic and don't need you to pass a speech check or do much to impress her. In the case of Amanda here, we're going to Victoria Peaks after hours when it's closed. After bribing the guard, Wei will walk around with her and snap photos of her with his phone for her blog. Impressed with his ability to take photos for Instagram, which any of you in the audience with a girlfriend knows is way harder than it sounds, Amanda immediately gives up the goods. So, uh, was this like a, a date? Sounds good to me. What do you think? Definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, thank you for the date then. So, hey. I have an idea. Oh, really? Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> After sexing her real good, Wei will now be able to see nearby health shrines on the minimap. And then she vanishes from the plot, never to be seen again. Which left me so confused the first time I played, especially since they had Emma Stone voicing Amanda. You'd think she would have had a bigger role in the plot as a way to market the game, with Emma playing the love interest that Wei has to constantly lie to and cover up his secret of being an undercover cop while also protecting her from the dangers of working for the Triad. But nope, she's basically a glorified cameo. Admittedly, I'm fine that the girlfriends don't play a bigger role in the main story. I had no issue with San Andreas doing the same thing. But San Andreas' girlfriend system was more fleshed out, as he had to take girls out on multiple dates, choosing things they like in order to raise their relationship value, until you max it out and gain whatever bonus they offered. Yeah, being able to unlock the ability to see a certain collectible on the map instantly is useful, but maybe you can unlock more clothes or cars if you continue dating them? I don't know, could just be me being nitpicky. As someone who has sunk hundreds of hours into Persona 4 and 5, I really loved all the work involved in getting your relationship up with another character, the small stories they'd have and all their interactions with the playable character, not just whatever bonus or upgrade you'd get for doing it. It just feels more like something that was thrown in as opposed to a mechanic they put some real thought into. That's it for the tutorials and dating for now, so let's head back to the Golden Koi and continue our work for the Sinan Yi. My man Wei! He's done good! He restored order to the night market. Well, he took a chance on me, Winston. I wanted to make sure it paid off. You got the right attitude. It's gonna pay off for you. Winston, impressed by Wei's abilities, gives him his own minibus racket to control. He just needs to take control of the route from its current owner, Dog Eyes. Grabbing some of the boys will have to hit up some of the bus stops under Dog Eyes' control, taking out his men and stealing his former customers. During this fun drive around the city, Conroy, that guy I brought up before, will be giving Wei a lot of shit. Still suspicious of who he is and what his motives are, he recounts the story of how they found the previous rat in the Sinan Yi, and how his refusal to kill gave him away, more or less repeating everything Jackie told us earlier. Conroy's shit-talking doesn't phase Wei, 
and we managed to finish the job without further incident. Our antics and taking over the minibus racket didn't go unnoticed by Dog Eyes. As explained by Winston in the next mission, the manager running Club Bam Bam has stopped paying him protection money and is now siding with Dog Eyes. So it's up to Way to go and change his mind. After getting past the bouncer and into the main club, he needs to sweet talk the hostess and his next one night stand, Tiffany, in order to find Benny, which he does by demonstrating his lovely singing voice during some karaoke. Assuming I played the audio in the clip and didn't replace it with a Yakuza song to avoid a copyright claim, I like how Wei sounds like he's just a normal guy doing karaoke. Will Yun Lee isn't giving this crazy singing performance, just what you would expect from the average person who does karaoke. I realize what I'm saying might sound extremely stupid, but I'm so used to the top tier singing in the Yakuza series that I forget most karaoke singers are bad to average at best. That's kind of the whole fun of karaoke, seeing who in your friend group is the most tone deaf. Getting Tiffany's number and finding out where Benny is, we'll head upstairs, get into a giant fight with a bunch of dog eyes goons that spills onto the dance floor and ends in the bathroom, where Benny will see the error of his ways and go back to Team Winston. Coming back to Club Bam Bam later for a date with Tiffany, Wei will sing for her again. Sex are good in the VIP room, and now see the locations of Jade statues on the minimap. Since we spent some decent time with the Sun on Yi now, it's time to check in with Raymond. You're late. Conroy's still watching me. He's got a real hard on. Is your cover compromised? Well, you haven't fished me out of the harbor yet. All right. How are you doing? How am I doing? <laughs> Fuck, Raymond, where do I start? There's a civil war brewing in the Sun on Yi. Winston and Dog Eyes escalated practically every day. Don't you read my Reports? I mean you personally, how are you doing? <laughs> While Wei is certainly on edge, he's got more issues to deal with, as after you complete the first cop case and take down Popstar, Winston will ask him to drop by the Golden Koi. Wei, we've been waiting for you. You guys smell something? I do. Get your sexy glow shoe. You know what happens to rats, Wei? Uh, yeah, I, I heard. Conroy gave me all the details when he was helping me out on that minute. Uh, 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 you're so Santa! Who the f do you think you are, huh? You come in out of nowhere and suddenly our guys start to get arrested? He ran it out, pop star Winston. I know he did. Oh, you're gonna do it. This motherfucker right here is a snitch. Is that right, Mink? You fucking rat. I sent you to pop star, but now he's in jail. Yeah? And who stands to gain the most from that? You're gonna take over Popstar's whole ketamine racket now. No more scraps for you. You'll supply the whole city with drugs. You and Dog Eyes. Popstar's gone, but you're still dealing, aren't you? So who's supplying you? Are you guys actually listening to this asshole? He's a rat. He's a fucking rat. Take him the whole guy, young and stop. You're still working for that bastard, aren't you, I'm Wait, listen, I swear. Oh, he's a dirty fucking man. Don't my wall. My wall. You get in this business for yourself, you're bound to end up like a little long time. You know what happens to rats when he ran it out past our incident? I know he did! What are you gonna do to what? <laughs> While Wei narrowly managed to avoid blowing his cover, he got to see up close and personal what will happen to him if he does. Since I haven't really gone into it, Now's as good a time as ever to talk about Wei's character. I brought up that he's mostly a by-the-books cop, who can get a little violent at times. It's mentioned in the in-game case files, but remember how I said he wanted to take down the gang that supplied his sister with the drugs she OD'd on? Well, he didn't exactly do it within the law, as it's widely believed Wei was responsible for gunning down the gang's leader, Tu Hat Chin, and that he personally tortured and killed Ming Ming Trin, the dealer who sold Mimi the drugs that led to her overdose. While the game states that no evidence proved Wei was involved, 
It's also heavily hinted that the San Francisco Police Department may have covered it up. So Raymond's belief that Wei could still be on a vendetta is a reasonable concern. Despite that reputation, he's actually very calm and a level-headed guy. Wei tends to de-escalate situations, talking down the more hot-headed Winston into taking less violent routes that will yield better results for him. Wei's issue is less that he might sink to that low again, and more the identity crisis he starts to suffer from as he gets closer to the Sanan Yi. It's admittedly a bit of a cliché, as you see this thing happen a lot in movies centering around an undercover cop infiltrating a criminal organization, where spending time learning about and bonding with the criminals he's supposed to take down, he starts questioning what's more important, his duty to the law or his loyalty to his new friends. Think Brian and his relationship with Dom in the first Fast and the Furious movie. Still the best one in the series as far as I'm concerned. Wei is a bit of a unique take on this trope, mainly because the people involved are ones he previously knew and grew up with. Spending time with his old friends and catching up with them, he has a much harder time wanting to take them down. You can even argue that part of the reason he tries to de-escalate things is less to save himself from doing more unsavoring things, but to stop his old friends from going too far, and to potentially get them a lesser sentence when they get brought down. Of course, that would ignore anything they've done before he came back, but still. The issue of him going on a vendetta does rear its head later, but for different reasons, and I want to avoid spoilers for now. It's time for Wade to once again jeopardize his safety, as we need to start bugging Winston and spying on all his going-ons for the Sunan Yi. First, we need to pick up the spying equipment from a techie chick by the name of Ping. Can I help you with something? Yeah. Are you Ping? <laughs> no. There's no Ping. How about the owner, then? I'm the owner. I'm just not Ping. <laughs> all right, not Ping. I'm picking up hardware for Orange Lotus. You know it? Orange Lotus? Sure. This is some pretty sophisticated stuff. Sure you can handle it? I'll manage. My number's on the package. You need a hand getting slot X into socket Y? Give me a call. Smooth way. Real smooth. Not Ping is his next girlfriend, who after the obligatory date and sexing, will mark hackable security cameras on the minimap. After briefly getting robbed and getting our bug back, Wei will need to sneak into the golden koi without being spotted in order to plant it. We'll then get some quick little mini games where he has to unscrew a vent, calibrate the bug, punt the vent back on, and unlock the back door to escape before Winston shows up. The little mini games remind me of the same ones from Chinatown Wars, though they don't pop up as often. Mission complete, it's time to risk Wei's cover yet again by working with Inspector Tang on her next case. This time around, she wants help in taking down an illegal street racer by the name of Hotshot. Really swung for the fences with that nickname. We'll call up our boy Jackie to see if he knows anything about the illegal street racing circuit. And he says to hit up a guy by the name of Ace. Grabbing a fast car, we need to beat Ace in a race before we can learn more about Hotshot. And it's stupidly easy. Mainly because the game doesn't stop you from just ramming into the other racers in order to take the lead. After winning the race, we'll now know how to find Hotshot. The next lead in the case having Wei bug the guy's car and trail him to listen in on his conversation. That guy Naz from the opening of the game makes a reappearance, talking a lot of shit about Wei and insinuating to Hotshot that he might be a cop. We'll have to do another race before the final lead in the case unlocks. Wei is set to meet up with Ace, but when the guy's a no-show, he'll have to trace his phone to find his location, which we do by running around the street till we get a good cell phone signal. Racing to his location, we're too late, as he and his girlfriend were run off the road by Hotshot in an attempt to kill him. While he succeeded in killing Ace, his girlfriend is still alive, and with her testimony, we can lock up Hotshot for good. After we trick him into racing us and lead him into a police ambush. Police work complete for now, time to get back to undercover work. We'll get a call from Tiffany, who was asked by another client to dispose of a gun and needs Wei's help in getting rid of it. The said gun belongs to Charlie Pang, a guy working under dog eyes. Calling up Raymond to let him know about this important piece of evidence, He'll set up a meetup under an underpass, though when we arrive we're greeted by Pendrew instead, who walks way through the crime scene of a recent shootout and begins the shooting tutorial of the game. Due to the game's setting of Hong Kong, where guns are much rarer to come by than in the States, Sleeping Dogs doesn't have a heavy focus on shooting gameplay. In a similar fashion to True Crime Streets of LA, that means you can't buy any new guns, you can't pull out your pistol during a brawl, 
and any new guns you come by during a mission get dropped and don't get carried on into the next one, with the exception of some unlockable pistols you can acquire, which I think is to the game's benefits as it allows for more mission variety and stops you from steamrolling every encounter by pulling out your best gun. As for the shooting gameplay, it's fine, but it's a bit iffy. To start, you got your standard cover mechanics, snap behind an object and pop your head out to return fire, or fire blindly over it while protecting yourself. By vaulting over an object and holding down the left trigger as you do, you'll enter a slow motion bullet time mode that makes it easier to land headshots and pick off multiple enemies. The iffiness comes from actually trying to aim and shoot. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure if this is an issue with the PC version and using a controller with it, as I didn't get the same feeling when I played it on PS4. When I'm manually aiming, it can feel a bit stiff trying to move the cursor, even when you're vaulting and things are slowing down. Other times, the cursor seems to work off some kind of aim assist, as it will lock on to an enemy faster. And other times, I have no issues at all, and it works perfectly fine. I actually went back and replayed a few of the different levels to try to get a better understanding of it, and I think it has to do with the specific guns you're using. Pistols and guns with slower rates of fire have that stiffer aiming, while assault rifles and guns with higher rates of fire, the aiming is much smoother. I'm not sure if this was an intentional design choice, and it's not terrible, but it can feel wonky in the middle of bigger firefights, especially when you switch to another weapon. Also, enemies tend to be more spongy than I'm used to, and your headshots can be inaccurate, meaning you could end up firing several shots before it actually domes the guy you're shooting at. Despite that though, shootouts aren't completely overwhelming, thanks to the generous amount of cover, objects you can shoot to cause explosions, the fact you can abuse the vaulting slow motion, and because you can disarm enemies if you charge at them and knock them down. Some of the perks in the cop and triad skill trees will also improve your aim, and with one perk giving you stronger explosive rounds for your pistol. You can also shoot while driving, which actually controls surprisingly well. I've never been a fan of this mechanic in other games like GTA. It always felt so awkward trying to balance driving and shooting at the same time. Here, thanks to the camera control and a larger cursor, it's much easier to shoot someone you're chasing or who's chasing you and you can disable an enemy's car by just shooting out a tire, which will cause things to slow down as you watch their car or motorcycle flip into the air, ending these encounters much faster. Overall, I think the shooting's fine. Not terrible by any means, just iffy to get used to. Since the majority of encounters in this game are hand-to-hand, -hand, you won't be in enough shootouts where it becomes a bigger problem. If I had to take a guess, shooting might have been thrown in later in development, explaining why it feels a bit unpolished. Oh, and this whole shooting tutorial we were doing with Pendrew? Turns out we were actually staging a crime scene. Good firing, Way. Pendrew! What are you doing? I told you he wasn't important. Now he is. He's going to help us nail Charlie Pang. It's for the greater good, Way. You understand? Call me crazy, but I'm starting to think the police aren't any less dirty than the criminals they're trying to put away. Our newly acquired gunslinging skills get some immediate use in the next mission, as the civil war in the Sunong Yi has escalated yet again. Dog Eyes went after Winston's family, shooting up the Golden Koi, injuring some of the customers, and killing two of his men. Though his mother luckily made it out okay. Boiling with anger, he wants the sweatshop Dog Eyes moves his drugs through burned to the ground, and a dealer by the name of Shi Wa who runs the place dead. Once again, Wei talks him down reminding him that taking such a big source of money from the Sunan Yi could piss off their chairman. He suggests burning the place down, but keeping the dealer alive, putting him to work for Winston and kicking the chairman a bigger cut. He agrees to Wei's plan and sends a large group of boys to the warehouse to get the job done. After fighting through half of the sweatshop and shooting my way through the other half, we'll find Siwa and chase after him as everything explodes around us. The local cops will greet us outside, and Siwa will give us the slip and run off in a cop car, leading to one more chase that introduces the action hijack mechanic. Dragging the guy back to a garage owned by Winston, he'll thank Wei for all his good work, and that asshole Conroy apologizes for not trusting him. Hey man, look, I don't do this often, but uh, I'm sorry, I was wrong about you. You show your true colors tonight, brother. Well, all right. Looks like we're finally proving ourselves and starting to make some real moves in the Sunan Yi. Everything's coming up Millhouse. Nothing can go wrong now. 
Oh, hey, Calvin. What's up, buddy? What's up? I got some bad news for you. You know Tiffany from the club. She's been stepping out, seeing that long finger child on the side. What? Uh, there's no way. Listen, man. I overheard her talking to him on the payphone outside her place. I guess she's keeping him off her cell. What? Tiffany? The love of my life? Cheating on me? How could she do something like this to me? After some illegal wiretapping, we confirm it's true. And with Calvin's help, he'll tell us when she goes and meets her other man. Thanks, Calvin. You're a real one. I'll convince the department to let you plead to a lesser charge when I take down the Sunan Yi. Oh, so the big triad gangster is mad now? Only the big triad gangster can sleep with other people? Whoa, triad? I'll see you later. Who is this not pink person? You think you can fool around on me and I don't care? She didn't mean anything to me. It was just part of work. Wow, Tiffany. Cheating is one thing, but going through my phone without my consent? How can I possibly trust someone who doesn't trust me? I think it's better that we go our separate ways. Oh well. At least I still have not ping. Say, Dinyan, I went by Batman Club looking for you. Who's Tiffany? You rat! You cheating pig! I can't believe I ever fell for you! I can't believe I let you do all those things! I will never forgive you! Never! Just don't even try! Just don't even bother! Okay? Okay, call me! Man, you really can't find a good woman these days, can you? Oh well. Who needs them? They're just a distraction from my work for the Sun on Yi. I'll just go to bed, wake up recharged, and go hang out with Winston and the homies. This guy wants in? He's gonna have to show me some blood on his hands. You show your true colors tonight, brother. You are an officer of the law. <laughs> Meeting up with Winston, his little war with dog eyes hasn't gone unnoticed by the chairman of the Sun on Yi. Uncle Poe. He's called a sit down to get his side of the story, and Winston will ask Wei to accompany him there. The boss man is noticeably rattled, as even by keeping Siwa alive, Uncle Poe could still punish or even kill Winston due to this whole mess. On the way there, he admits his frustrations in getting put into this situation in the first place. Proud of all he's built, but potentially losing it all, just because Dog Eyes got greedy, and Winston couldn't stand down. Having grown closer and more confident in Wei's abilities, he asks him to look out for the rest of the gang in case something happens to him, admitting he's far more capable of a leader than his other men. Aw, that's sweet, Winston. But hopefully it won't come to that. Uncle Poe. Ah, Winston! Come in. Sit down. Have some tea. And you, young man, must be Wei. Winston speaks very highly of you. Winston has been a good friend to me. I've tried to do right by him. I like the way you think. That's the attitude that makes us strong. Loyalty, discretion. Used to be more common. It's been a while since we got ourselves another notable actor in this game, with James Hong providing the voice of Uncle Poe. Fitting he would star in what was once a game part of the true crime series, as he was also the voice of Ancient Wu in Streets of L.A., and I think he played another character in Streets of New York. Despite Uncle Poe's kind demeanor, there's a thick tension in the air as he has a reputation for being ruthless. His polite demeanor slips when he glares at Winston when Wei tries to give him all the credit for sparing and saving Siwa, and again when he insists that Wei not argue with him and to just accept his gratitude. He'll send him away to go work for an associate of his named Roland Ho, who does debt collection. Leaving Winston alone with him and his advisor, it really does feel like this could be the end for the guy. Even as Uncle Poe starts off by saying that he understands Winston was provoked by dog eyes. Luckily, he does make it out of that room unscathed. Driving out to meet Roland Ho, the old guy offers Wei some advice after hearing about his situation with dog eyes. Here's a tip for you, kid. Don't take on a boss in your own triad unless you know for a fact someone else is gonna back you up. Hierarchy is the only thing anyone cares about. Always have, always will. <laughs> Certainly some important info to take to heart. Anywho, he needs us to go collect a debt owed to him by a woman named Patsy Wing. Tracking her down, chasing after her, and taking out the guy she hired for protection, we'll hijack her ride and confront her about the money she owes. She apologizes and begs not to be killed, offering up the drugs in the trunk of her car as payment for her debt. Returning the car to the impound lot, 
we can now do debt collection jobs for Roland as a way to make some extra money. Afterwards, Wei will meet up with Raymond, who grills him about what happened at the warehouse, threatening to pull the plug on the whole operation. Though he calms down after finding out Wei has personally met with Uncle Poe and is being marked for promotion. Raymond still warns to reel things in, as it could be disastrous if the media finds out a police officer is involved in creating this chaos. Heading over to the Golden Koi, we'll meet with Winston's mother, Miss Chu. Her son is getting married and she asks Wei a favor in helping the bride to pick something up for their wedding. Agreeing to help, we'll head outside and meet Winston's fiance, Peggy. Hello, Wei. Thanks for driving me around. Yeah, no problem. So where are we going? The flower shop. I still have to pick the color I want. You won't believe how much work it is to get ready for a wedding. We've been planning for eight months now, and there's still so much to be done. I'm sure it'll be fine. Oh, it better be perfect. My wedding has to be perfect. Damn. What is a babe like her seeing a guy like Winston? Peggy is pretty chill and a nice girl. She considers Wei and the other guys in the gang like her family, insisting that he let her set him up with a girlfriend after her wedding. She even manages to get along well with Miss Chu, who took Peggy's side and sat Winston down one day, screaming at him to start treating his future wife better after finding out he was neglecting her. We'll first take Peggy to the bridal shop so she can try on her wedding dress, before receiving a text from Winston who says the van carrying their wedding cake was stolen, probably by dog eyes. Christ, this guy is so fucking petty. After finding the van and saving the cake, we'll break into a Shaolin temple to steal an orchid so Peggy can use it as the centerpiece at her wedding. Everything in place for Winston's wedding. We'll skip ahead to the big day. Aw, look at those two. They look so great together. I hope that they have many years together and that their first child will be a masculine child. Hearing gunshots and finding some guests dead outside, once Wei makes his way inside the main hall, he'll discover that the catering staff were actually triads in disguise, possibly their rivals, the 18K, and are now attacking the wedding guests. Fighting and then shooting our way through them, Wei will eventually make it to Winston and Peggy, but he's too late. Winston! Shit! Oh, oh God. Peggy! She doesn't deserve this. Winston. Winston! Fuck. Oh, shit. Peggy. Got another one. Go on, shit. If you played Sleeping Dogs before, chances are this moment, and one other one, has stuck with you the way it's stuck with me all these years. This was basically my red wedding before the actual red wedding on Game of Thrones. Not only is it shocking, but it happens just as Wei was growing closer and building a real camaraderie with Winston, Peggy, and the rest of the gang. While things have slowly been growing more and more violent over the game, this level of brutality is on an entire different level. Not only did the perpetrator cross the line by attacking Winston on what was supposed to be the happiest day of his life, he broke the triad tradition of not attacking during sacred events like a wedding or a funeral, which will no doubt mean war but also means the police will get involved due to all the civilians caught in the crossfire. Poor Winston. You weren't exactly a saint, but no one deserves to be gunned down on their wedding day, let alone watching your wife get killed before your own eyes before you bite it. Don't worry, buddy. I'm going to hunt the bastards responsible and get revenge for you and Peggy. Fighting through the wedding hall, we'll spot Uncle Poe who gets shot and chased by the attackers. Reaching him, Wei will have to get the old man to the hospital before he bleeds out all the while fighting off the remaining attackers. After getting him to a doctor and fleeing the scene, Wei will meet up with Raymond again. He wants to pull him off the job, worried things are becoming too personal for him with the death of his friends, which it certainly has now. But with Winston dead, Wei has effectively taken his place as leader of the Water Street Gang, basically becoming the new Red Pole by default. Raymond backs off again, but it's only a matter of time before things boil over and Wei loses control. Anything happens to me, you look after my people, okay? Get Peggy out of here. Winston! She doesn't deserve this. No!
Mrs. Chu. I was just stopping by to see if there was anything you needed. Dropping in on Miss Chu to offer his condolences, Wei lets her know that he recognized one of the shooters and promises to find him and get answers on why they attacked Winston. She has another idea though, and asks him to bring the guy to her instead. I wasn't sure who Wei was talking about at first, but it was this guy we saw who shot and chased after Uncle Po, a guy by the name of Johnny Ratface. After calling up Ricky Wong, someone we briefly met before sitting down with Uncle Po, he gives us the guy's number and we track him down to the docks. After a very long sequence that has us chasing him all over Hong Kong, we nab him and bring him back to Mrs. Chu. Johnny the rat face. Meet Mrs. Chu. Winston's mother. Asama! I don't know what this guy told you! Fuck! I don't know what you're talking about, you crazy old bitch! Please! Wait, wait! Don't leave me here! She's fing crazy! Okay, okay! I'll tell you anything you want to know! Just please, don't! Heading over to Club Bam Bam to meet with the boys, they get into a discussion about what their next moves are and how they plan to get revenge on the 18K, the Sunan Yi's rival triad who most believe were responsible for the wedding massacre. Wei isn't convinced it's them and thinks some other group may want them to think it was 18K in order to cover their trail. Their conversation is soon interrupted by the arrival of Ponytail, the right-hand man of Big Smile Lee, another red pole in the Sunan Yi. With Winston's death, he's there to let them know that all profits from the club will now go to Big Smile Lee. Wei, however, isn't done with that idea, which leads to a giant shootout throughout the club, which eventually spills onto the streets. From there, he and Jackie will chase after Ponytail, Wei going at it solo when their car gets taken out, the mission ending in a one-on-one -on -one fight between the two. Tell your boss, stay the fuck out of my territory. <laughs> fuck you, Wei. <laughs> Come on, Wei. After all that, how did you let him get away? Running from the cops, he gets saved by a mysterious person in a limousine. Once they make it to safety, he's properly introduced to his savior, Broken Nose Jang, yet another red pull in the Sun on Yi. She reminds Wei that he'll need the backing of another red pull if he plans to butt heads with Big Smile Lee. Jang is willing to be that person. However, she's concerned about the stability of the Sun on Yi especially if Uncle Poe doesn't survive his injuries. So an election would need to be held to choose the next chairman, not so subtly asking for Wei to back her if and when the time comes, as the only other option would be Big Smile Lee, who Jang feels will ultimately lead the triad to ruin with his more ruthless ways. Since that asshole Lee just shot up our club, it's an easy choice to back her. Touching base with our little buddy Jackie, we'll help him in getting the money owed to him from that scumbag Naz who I forgot to mention has been working as an informant for the Hong Kong PD this whole time, but he's a shitty one who is still committing crimes under their noses. Since he knows Wei is an undercover cop and could blow his cover, we'll have to grab him and deliver him to Inspector Tang, who will lock him up to keep him from snitching. Returning to the Golden Koi, Miss Chu managed to get some information out of Johnny Ratface before turning him into soup, and has learned who was behind the wedding massacre. Sammy? Dog eyes. Dog eyes did it. Is that what Johnny told you? Turns out it was dog eyes all along. Which, I mean, yeah, no shit. He and Winston were beefing through the entire first half of the game. Dog eyes was the one constantly escalating things. And he's scummy enough to attack someone on their wedding day when they've dropped their guard. Hunting down dog eyes, he at first thinks Wei is after him because of what happened to his sister. Before Wei tells him it's actually about the wedding. He tries to bargain and make a deal with him, offering to cut him in on the business he's running with Big Smile Lee. His pleas falling on deaf ears, Wei will fight his way out of the fish factory and deliver dog eyes to Miss Chu. Oh, what, what the f*** are you doing, huh? Wait, 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 wait! Sit down and shut the f*** up. Jesus, I haven't been here in f***ing years. 
Sammy 啊，为咗你一路开住个厨房，你睇我留埋啲骨喺里面，你中意噶嘛？系咪啊 ？It's cool, Mr. Chu. I already ate. 你同我食晒佢，食咗佢。喂，诶 ，What the f are you doing? I'm not fucking hungry. Sammy， 你避下我面，我特登为你做噶。使劲，唔系净系你一个人，有朋友 Johnny 啊，老鼠仔，佢都喺度啊。What the fuck is crazy？ 佢而家喺汤里面，或者我将你放喺煲汤里面。If you have a problem with me, then let's sort it out ourselves, okay? We don't need to bring her into this. Sorry, it's nothing personal, just business. Oh God, I'm sorry, please, please, no, no, no. Well, I think this is a fitting end for Dog Eyes. Getting hacked to pieces by the mother of his former friend that he killed. I'm not so thrilled about Big Smell Lee taking the reins and becoming the big bad for the rest of the game. Mainly because he lacks the cockiness and personal connection to Wei that made Dog Eyes a compelling villain that you love to hate. Big Smell Lee is basically your run of the mill evil crime boss. Like they try to connect him to Dog Eyes' actions, but nothing outright says he ordered the wedding massacre. It ends up benefiting him for sure, but with Uncle Pole getting shot. But that seems more like a coincidence than something he planned for. I don't know, maybe there's some cut dialogue or content that would have tied him to the whole ordeal better. Oh well. In the meantime, we got another police case to take care of. Dropping in on Inspector Tang, she needs help in investigating a potential serial killer. One who's been targeting triads for the last six months. Heading down to where the local cops are holding his latest victims, we find out one of them is our fellow gangmate, Vincent. Uh, who was he again? Oh, this guy. Uh, yeah. Kinda hard to feel anything here when the guy is basically a background character. Oh, and I'm just going to speed run through this case, as we're not investigating a real serial killer, but a crooked doctor who was harvesting organs and selling them on the black market for the 18k. Man, another disappointing serial killer side mission after the last one in Watch Dogs? What the hell? Well, let's just go and check in on Uncle Poe. Heading to the hospital, he gathered his remaining red poles, broken nose Jang, Big Smile Lee, and his nephew, Tu Chin Sao. Any guesses on why he's called that? The Sun On Yi needs a temporary chairman until Uncle Po is recovered. Big Smile Lee tries to nominate himself for the job, but Jang beats him to the punch and nominates Tu Chin, as she believes that since he's Uncle Po's immediate family, he can maintain stability and carry out his wishes without any agenda. The old man agrees, while also asking his advisor, Pock Mark, to formally initiate Wei to become a Red Pole, and that he also bring along any members in his group that aren't formally Sun On Yi. Yeah, despite all the work we've been doing for them, pretty much everyone under Winston was still considered foot soldiers and part of his gang, but not full Sun On Yi. Wei's initiation requires him to hunt down and eliminate a former dealer for the Triad, one who refused to stop selling to kids and switch sides to the 18K. Telling Jackie the good news, we'll pick him up to find our target and things don't go exactly as planned. Despite saving Wei's life and ensuring their promotion, poor Jackie is shaken up after the shooting. Despite initially getting Wei in with Winston and his crew, the kid never really went at this life hard. He always tries to make his moves by stealing and selling goods, and never really took part in the more ugly work the gang does. This is the first time he's ever killed someone, and even if it was to protect his friend, it's still an ugly feeling. Things will only get worse for Jackie too, as after the gang are all sworn in and become official Sun On Yi, Wei will meet with Raymond who wants him to start investigating an associate of the Triads by the name of Sunny Wo. Oh, and to set up Jackie to get arrested so they can use him as an informant. Wei doesn't take it well. Oh, before I forget, Jackie Ma, we're taking him in. Jackie? From what I read in your reports, he'll be a good source of info, and it won't be hard to make him talk. We'll need you to set him up no, for no, us. No, that, that makes no sense. He's nobody. He's a criminal, Wei. You're a cop. I hate to be a broken record, but it sounds like you're getting attached. I'm not getting attached. I'm just... I'm not a idiot, okay? He's part of my cover. He brought me in. He's the one who vouched for me. And now you're so high up, you don't need him. 
He's outlived his usefulness, so we're bringing him in. I'm taking this up with Pendrew. This came from Pendrew. Taking him in accomplishes nothing, and it makes my job harder. I'm not doing it. You don't have a choice, all right? It's a direct order. Yeah? Direct order? Well, that's an order you can shove directly up your ass, Raymond. We want the Red Pulls, the lieutenants like Winston. Open your eyes, Raymond. I am Winston now. That's what worries me, Way. You're one of them. His superiors having forced his hand, Wei has no choice but to set up his buddy Jackie. Meeting up with the kid, he tells us about a shipment of jewelry that the 18K are about to receive down at the docks. On our way down there to steal it from them, he fills us in that he hasn't been sleeping so well since he killed that dealer. It also sounds like Jackie is starting to have second thoughts about this life too. You could tell Wei actually cares, trying his best to reassure him about what happened and even trying to talk him into laying low for a while till he feels better. Hating himself and Pendrew when he watches Jackie get ambushed and picked up by the cops at the end of the mission. Sometime later, we'll get a frantic call from Ricky, who needs Wei down at the hospital, as the 18K are attacking the place trying to finish off Uncle Poe. Despite having zero backup and fighting an almost endless army of 18K triads, the pair managed to survive and protect the chairman. Ricky points out it was just dumb luck though, and with the triad code deteriorating even more, he believes things are going to get even worse. That said, we did impress him, as in the next mission, Ricky will formally introduce us to Sonny Well. Sonny is a shady businessman working with Big Smile Lee, running a legitimate operation as a record producer, and an illegitimate one creating porn using kidnapped women. He asks Wei to show a record producer from America named King around Hong Kong. Doing just that, We'll drop by a club called K-Bar and meet Wei's next girlfriend, a Russian hostess named Ileana. Calling her after this mission and going jogging for their date, he'll sex her real good and can now see the locations of lockboxes on the minimap. After showing King a good time, we'll drop him off at his place and he and Wei will make a deal to distribute drugs from LA. Returning to Sunny, he wants Wei to go pick up his newest upcoming starlet, a girl by the name of Vivian, who is also Ricky's girlfriend. Heading out to meet her, we're introduced to her friend, Sandra, Wei's final hookup, and who is voiced by Lucy Liu. Like Emma Stone as Amanda, it feels really weird they only have her in the game as a glorified cameo. More so since this game's roots started as an action game with a female lead modeled after her. You'd think they would have brought back that idea in some form now that they had the real Lucy Liu working with them. Anywho, after Wei calls her up and shows her how fast and furious he is on the streets, and in the sheets, She'll unlock more racing missions. Kind of a lackluster reward compared to the other girls. Especially since there's so many races dotted on the map already. I get they were out of collectibles, and all the other optional stuff like the fight clubs, cockfights, and mahjong are already on the map. But I don't know, maybe unlocking her sweet ride would have been better. After the mission ends and Wei is done playing chauffeur, he'll get a call from Ileana whose friend has gone missing. This unlocks the final police case, which involves a kidnapping ring. I'm going to skip the finer details, but Wei will discover a guy named Yar Kwai Lai is behind the kidnappings. And after asking Ileana to act as bait, he's able to find the missing girls and get the evidence needed to put the guy away. This case ended up making Ileana my favorite of Wei's girlfriends, mainly because she has a little more to do, and you can actually get to learn more about her. It's not much, but it's something. Or maybe I'm just a sucker for a girl with a Russian accent. Who knows? Ah! Kind of you to join me. Care for some tea? Like, like, yum tea. Thank you. Meeting up with Broken Nose Jang, she's not thrilled that Tu Chin is getting so comfy in his position as temporary chairman, especially since he plans to make it permanent if Uncle Po dies. Since Big Smile Lee will most likely kill him and take leadership of the Sun on Yi by force if that does happen, Jang proposes an idea to have him step down voluntarily and force an election to be held. She wants to take advantage of Tu Chin's drug habit, upping the quality of his supply and then having Wei push him over the edge so he'll use again. Since the guy is extremely superstitious and heavily believes in feng shui, Wei will team up with Old Salty Crab, Jang's driver, and break into Tu Chin's house. Then once inside, they'll move shit around in order to mess with him. He doesn't have a huge role in the plot, but I love Old Salty Crab. 
He's a funny guy, and he really gets into messing with Tuchin. Wait, wait, wait. See that clock? Set the time 4.44 and unplug it. That'll freak him out. 4.44. <laughs> yeah, this could work. Also, he's apparently not Ping's uncle. Though I'm not sure if that's stated anywhere in the main story, as I only learned it during the DLC story, which I'll briefly cover towards the end of the video. After successfully driving a man into a drug habit, Jang will call up with some bad news. Uncle Poe has died. Well, shit. It'll be a bit until his funeral, and the election for the next chairman is held, so it's time to head back to Sunny Wo. Arriving at his studio to talk with him, Ricky will hang out for a bit before leaving to a premiere party with Vivian. Once he's out of earshot, Sunny asks Wei to break into and bug Vivian's apartment so he can keep an eye on all her moves and use anything he finds against her if she flakes or tries to quit. Breaking into her place, Wei will plant the bugs and then avoid getting spotted when Ricky and Vivian show up. Using a USB to steal some info off her laptop, he'll sneak out of there and then meet up with Pendrew. Wanting an update on Wei's progress investigating Sunny Wo, he thinks the data we stole could be the piece they need to take him down. Wei doesn't want to involve Vivian at first, but laments and agrees to getting his boss a copy of what he stole, but only if he frees Jackie, which Pendra agrees to. Heading back to his apartment to make a copy, Vivian unexpectedly drops in. Sunny sends her to take care of Wei, but he's a real one and can't sleep with his buddy's girl, much to her relief. Heading back to Pendrew, the mission closes as Wei's time in the Sinon Yi has come to an end. Wei, did you bring the video? And Jackie? Done. This should be all I need to put Sunny Wo away for a long time. And with Uncle Poe dead... Wait, how'd you hear about that? Good news travels fast. I'll have Raymond arrange your debriefing. Congratulations, Wei. What are you saying? I'm saying it's over. You've done your job. It's time to come in. It's not over. Not yet. Wei, the Sun on Yi is seriously crippled. Your mission was an unbelievable success. I must admit, I thought you'd be happy. Big Smiley will take over. It'll be even worse than it was under Poe. I can't come in now. I'm not finished yet. I understand your personal reasons for doing this, your history with the Sun on Yi. This is why I selected you. But you've done more than enough. Those are my orders. Fuck your orders and fuck you too, Penju. I came on to take down the sun on you, not to shuffle the deck. Shen, you're making a mistake. Wei, the sun on Yi is seriously crippled. Big smiley will take over. It'll be even worse than it was under Poe. Shen, you're making a mistake. Fuck your orders. Fuck you too, Penju. Way, good to see you, man. Thanks for picking me up. <laughs> you joking? Of course I'm gonna pick you up. You're my boy. You okay, Jackie? They treat you all right in there? Despite the heated exchange Way had with his boss about being done with his case, the old guy did honor his end of the deal and got our boy Jackie out of jail. We'll get him hooked with a new suit and then make our way to Uncle Poe's funeral. During the drive, he admits that while sitting in the joint, he's had a lot of time to think about what he wants with his life. He wants to leave the criminal life behind, especially if the end of that life is getting killed. Jackie isn't sure he's cut out for much of anything else, but at least he wants to try. Maybe run some kind of business with his girlfriend, Jumei. That's the girl he was sweet-talking near the beginning of the game, and we haven't seen since. Also, I'm not actually sure if she is his girlfriend now, but he brings her up a lot. Arriving at Uncle Poe's funeral, there aren't many people there outside of the Red Poles. Jackie... Ricky and Pockmark. I kind of figured the death of the chairman would mean that every member of the Sun on Yi would be in attendance, but I guess not. They probably should be though, as the 18K have shown up as well and are itching to start some shit. Only the police and Pendrew's presence keeping them in line. That is until they conclude their business and arrest Sunny Wo. Hey, you! You can't do this here! It's a fucking funeral! Goddamn police! Why don't you show some fucking respect, huh? Why don't you? The 18K are about to do this city a great public service. And anyone who stays here deserves everything they get. Pendrew leaving Wei and the rest of the Sinon Yi to the wolves. They're on their own as they have to shoot their way out of the cemetery. 
This is the first mission to give you an explosive weapon, as Wei will snatch a grenade launcher from one of the 18k. It blows up stuff real good. After making it to safety, the Red Pole leaders will get into an argument about instating a new chairman immediately. Despite Big Smile Lee's push to instate himself, he is forced to back down when Jang and Wei insist they follow tradition and have a proper election. Though he not so subtly threatens everyone there that electing anyone but him would be disaster for the Sunan Yi, a threat he promptly carries out in the following mission. Getting a text from Conroy and meeting up with them, Big Smile Lee has declared war, attacking all of the Sunan Yi controlled businesses, demanding they back him as chairman in the election or die. After driving around to push back against his forces, we'll go and meet with Ricky to convince him to turn his back on Sunny and Big Smile Lee. He's aggressive at first, thinking that Wei had stuck with Vivian, but when the two of them confirm Wei turned her away, something Ricky didn't even do when she was forced to approach him, he settles down. Vivian explains the cops have a video of her with Ricky, and they're threatening to release it if she doesn't testify against Sunny. Her safety on the line if Sunny finds out, Ricky agrees to side with Wei and keep her safe. With Sunny Wo out of the way, that just leaves Big Smile Lee to take care of. Wei will get a call and meet up with Raymond afterwards. He tries to get him to leave his assignment and come back clean. Now that he's crossed Pendrew, there's no telling what he'll do. It's very likely he'll expose that Wei is a cop and ensure he gets killed. Before we can formulate a plan on what to do next, he'll receive a call from Jackie. Jackie, not now. I'm busy. Look, it's Jackie. I need to go. Wait! Wait! Oh yeah, I forgot all about Jackie. After the chaos at the funeral, I didn't realize that he was nowhere to be seen when everyone got to safety. His abductor will send Wei a location on where to meet, which predictably is a trap as the 18k are waiting there to ambush him. After taking them all down, getting the phone off their ringleader horseshoes, and using it to trace the location of another guy, Ziwa, We'll chase after him and get his phone to finally find out Jackie's been buried alive on Magazine Island. Ah shit, I hope it's not too late. Calling up old Salty Crab in order to get his hands on some heavy artillery, Wei will hop on a boat and make his way to Jackie, fighting off an endless wave of 18k goons until he finally gets to the island. Jackie! Jackie, shit! Oh, fuck! Oh, fuck, man! You're alive! You alive? Oh, oh. I fucking crazy! Fuck! 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 Are you okay? Fuck! Oh, man. Oh, man. Calm down. I'm right here, brother. Thankfully, they only buried Jackie alive, so we made it in time before he ran out of air. On the way back to the mainland, he explains that Big Smile Lee's guys grabbed him at the funeral, this entire experience vindicating his decision to leave the Sin on Yi for good. Wei supports his choice, but asks him to come to the election and testify what Big Smile Lee did, which Jackie agrees to. The following day, Jackie will text Wei wanting to meet up, and, well, let's just let this scene play out. Jackie! Jackie! What the fuck? Oh, fuck! Oh my god! Jackie! Ah, oh, fuck! Jackie! Ah! Ah! Ah, 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 oh Jackie, my poor Jackie, you didn't deserve this. Like the wedding massacre, this is that other tragic scene from Sleeping Dogs. After having just saved his life, I'm sure most players would have assumed the kid was going to make it, especially since it was such a close call. But then bam, it pulls the rug from under you not only killing Jackie, but in a much more brutal way than Winston and Peggy. You can't see it because I had to censor it for YouTube, but the poor kid was gutted. His inside spilling out of him when Wei finds him, and he was heavily tortured before they finished him off. They didn't even kill him to shut him up, just as a means to get to Wei. Such a heartbreaking end for a kid who was so damn close to turning his life around. Hello, Mr. Shen. Or should I say... Officer Shen. <laughs> My name is Mr. Tom. Perhaps you heard of me? Fuck you! I'm no cop! When Wei comes to, 
He's been beaten up pretty bad and is now in the torture chair himself, coming face to face with Jackie's killer, the Sunan Yi's infamous Mr. Tong. He explains how they tortured him, revealing to the kid that Wei was an undercover cop, though Jackie refused to believe it and stayed loyal, denying any attempts to confirm it was true. Mr. Tong plans to torture Wei until he admits he's a police officer, using his confession to shame Broken Nose Jang and ensuring Big Smile Lee becomes chairman. It doesn't seem like they actually do know he's a cop, just working off rumors, so they need his confession. Tong immediately gets to work on Wei, slicing him up, smashing his toes with a hammer, using a fucking power drill on his leg. This guy doesn't fuck around. He gives Wei a break when he passes out, but will come back to continue his enhanced interrogation techniques. Unfortunately, he breaks movie villain rule number one, don't leave your henchmen alone with the hero, or else they might get away, as such. Wei finding his second win and activating his health regen will now fight his way out of the building, beating up everyone in the first room before shooting his way throughout the rest of the level until finding that bastard Mr. Tong and getting his revenge for Jackie. Heading to Big Smile Lee's location, it's another big shootout throughout the docks and then his restaurant, killing his right-hand man Ponytail, surviving a point-blank range hit from a shotgun, and then chasing after Big Smile Lee one last time, leading into a final battle surrounded by a ring of fire, just like in true crime streets of LA. Yo pussy! You're done! <laughs> Piece of fucking shit. Fuck! How does it feel, pig? To know that your boss sold you out. And you fucked your way almost as bad as you fucked Jackie. You were supposed to die with Winston. Dog eyes blew that. And that poor guy Tong. <laughs> fucking worthless London girl. But that's okay. I am gonna enjoy killing you myself. Fuck you. Man, this final fight is super underwhelming. Like, I'm glad it's not the frustratingly difficult fight against General Kim in Streets of LA. But man, there isn't really much here. You can't attack Big Smile Lee normally, and can only damage him with a counter. And since the window for a counter is huge, it's easy to hit him. So it's just a much slower fight than usual. Oh well. The way we finish him off more than makes up for it, though. All this dirty business finally over with. Raymond will check in with Wei. Thanks to Big Smile Lee, we now know for sure Pendrew blew his cover. Unfortunately, since we turned him into ice chips, we have no testimony to prove it. With Pendrew now up for promotion, and heading to Interpol, no one would listen to a word against him. It's a bittersweet ending. While Wei managed to stop Big Smile Lee, he was nothing but a puppet this entire time, and the true mastermind got off scot-free. Except not really, as when Wei returns to his apartment, he finds a package sent to him from Broken Nose Jang. It's hospital footage from the day of Uncle Po's death. Turns out he didn't die of complications from his gunshot. He was murdered. By Pendrew. The two of them had a secret arrangement made ages ago. 
Uncle Poe gave up his triad rivals, the Three Tigers, in order to make Pendry's career. In exchange, he would let the old man and Sonny continue their operations without issue, allowing the Sinan Yi to gain more control of Hong Kong and grow even more powerful. However, now that Pendrew had bigger plans on moving up to Interpol, he needed to clean up any loose ends, which meant arresting Sonny and killing Uncle Poe. Eh, I'm not sure how I feel about this reveal. On the one hand, I never even considered the idea Uncle Poe was murdered, so it's a nice twist. On the other hand, how did Jang get her hands on this footage? And it seems a little stupid for a schemer like Pendrew to risk incriminating himself by carrying out Uncle Poe's murder. It feels like things moved a little too fast here to ensure Pendrew goes down and not end the game with a bittersweet ending. What would you like me to say? Whatever I did, I made Hong Kong a better place. I serve the greater good. With Pendrew's aspirations up in flames, Wei gloats that he'll spend the rest of his life in prison, though it might not be a long life as his new prison buddies know he's a cop and that he killed Uncle Poe. With that, the game comes to an end as Wei speaks with Inspector Tang and decides what his next move is. So, what are you going to do now? I don't know. Job's over, but I don't really have anywhere else to go. <laughs> Strange to say it after all that's happened, but Hong Kong kind of feels like home. Yeah. But which Hong Kong, officer? And what about Wei Shen? He proved himself to be loyal to me. One way or the other. And isn't that what really matters? Leave him be. Yes, Anjie. Drive. Alrighty, before wrapping up this video and summing up my thoughts on the game as a whole, I'm going to briefly go through the DLC. I know I ended up skipping the DLC for Watch Dogs, so as an apology I'm going to do a shorter video review for that in the future, as it really deserved attention. First of the DLC is Nightmare in North Point, which brings a spooky spin on the game's setting. The restless spirits of the dead have escaped hell and are running amok in Hong Kong thanks to the machinations of Big Scar Wu a former Red Pole and the Sunan Yi who's come back looking for revenge. In life, he was too ruthless and out of control, so Uncle Poe ordered his execution, with Big Smile Lee's enforcer Ponytail carrying out the deed. He and a group of guys would run him over, stab him over 42 times, and finally grind up his body at a cat food factory. And as one final fuck you to him, they made sure to preserve his pinky finger, denying him proper rest, and so his spirit would never find peace in the afterlife. Man, what did he do to make them niggas that mad? Like for real, his demise is so excessive and petty. I really gotta wonder what he did exactly that pissed off Uncle Poe that much. After everyone in the underworld found out how he was turned into cat food, they started calling him Smiley Cat, the name of the brand and factory where his corpse was ground up. Hating his new nickname and everyone making fun of him in the afterlife, he broke out of hell seeking revenge on the Sinan Yi. And since most are dead by this point, he settles on tormenting Wei and kidnaps Not Ping, who I guess is his canon girlfriend. Smiley Cat has summoned an army of Chang Shi and Yao Guai to help him. Since Wei can't exercise them by chanting Yu Mo Guai Guai Fai Zi Zhao, he'll have to follow Uncle's other advice instead. Magic must defeat magic! After drinking a special tea that replaces his face meter with a sort of chi meter, Wei can now fight back against Smiley Cat's undead forces. Teaming up with the ghost of Vincent, you know, that one guy in the main story who was killed for his organs, Wei will stop the spirits of the underworld, save Not Ping, and put an end to Smiley Cat once and for all. Overall, it's a fun DLC, and probably my favorite of the three. Reminds me a lot of what Rockstar did with Undead Nightmare and Red Dead Redemption. It's just painfully short, with a runtime of about an hour, so it doesn't really get to explore the new ideas it introduces. The same problem plagues the other two DLCs. Next is the Zodiac Tournament, an homage to Game of Death and other 70s martial arts movies. Unlike the other two DLC, which can be started right from the main menu, for this one you have to go to the starting mission in-game to access it. Wei will participate in a mysterious martial arts tournament on a faraway island. Putting his kung fu skills to the test, 
You have to fight some of the best fighters around in order to win and make it out the island alive. Probably my least favorite of the three. While it does introduce new opal statues to collect and unlock a new mixed martial arts fighting style, it's again held back by being way too short. And the final DLC is Year of the Snake. Taking place after the events of the main story, and the only one of the DLC that could be considered canon, it starts with Wei being demoted to a regular beat cop. After doing some regular police work, he'll end up butting heads with the doomsday cult that believes the world will end on Chinese New Year. And to facilitate said end of the world, they have been ordered by their mysterious master to carry out various bombings all across Hong Kong. So it's up to Wei and Inspector Tang to hunt down the cultists, uncover their plans, and bring a stop to the master's plan before innocent people get killed during the Chinese New Year celebration. This one was a bit of a mixed bag. While I liked this storyline, most of the missions felt very repetitive, and it really didn't do much different from the main game. Overall, I liked the DLC, but I would have preferred one bigger content expansion as opposed to these three smaller slices. Turning Nightmare and North Point into a bigger story like Undead Nightmare with tons of new demonic creatures to fight and new moves to unlock would have been so much better. To sum up my thoughts on Sleeping Dogs as a whole, it really is the definition of a jack of all trades. It does quite a lot of things good, some great even, but doesn't necessarily excel or reinvent anything. And I'm totally okay with that. Like, not for nothing, when did being a jack of all trades become a bad thing? Not every game needs to redefine the genre or be the best in that genre. It's absolutely okay for a game to be an 8 or even a 7 out of 10 experience. I use the word masterpiece a couple times throughout this video, and when I say that, I don't mean Sleeping Dogs is perfect or flawless. When I call a game a masterpiece, it's because it created a fun and memorable experience where the positives far exceed the negatives to me. The last game I reviewed, Watch Dogs, was a fun game with engaging mechanics, a decent open world, and with some memorable side characters, but it was dragged down by its seriously flawed protagonist and story. Sleeping Dogs' flaws, however, aren't big enough where it drags down the entire experience. I wasn't big on Big Smile Lee being the big bad, or how abrupt the ending feels with dealing with Pendrew, but they don't distract from or ruin what's good. I like Wei as a protagonist. Hong Kong is gorgeous, its open world isn't too big, and it has just enough to find something to do outside the story. The combat is simple but fun. The shooting is a little iffy, but not terrible or frustrating. The story was strong enough to make me care about its characters. What happened to Winston, Peggy, and Jackie has stuck with me ever since I first played the game. It's got a lot of what makes Yakuza popular, and why I like that series so much. It's a game that got so much right on its debut. Shit, GTA 3 had a lot of flaws when it debuted, but it still ended up being popular and redefining gaming as we know it. Similar to my other favorite games I consider masterpieces, like San Andreas, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy X, and Mega Man Legends, Sleeping Dogs created an experience that stuck with me, and I love returning to it time and time again. It might sound hyperbolic, but that's what makes a game a masterpiece to me. I'd like to point the finger at Square Enix for killing the series and not greenlighting a sequel, but I don't know that I can. Remember, this game wouldn't have seen the light of day if they didn't buy the publishing rights from Activision. They needed to see some return on investment. So if they barely broke even, they may not have wanted to take the risk. Which sucks, but that story has been told hundreds of times in this industry, especially during the PS3 and 360 era, where tons of series and studios crumbled under the cost of HD gaming. Sleeping Dogs should have been the foundation for a new, big and popular gaming series, with millions of units sold. One that could be a proper rival to the GTA series, instead of being a flash in the pan, one of a kind experience. And that's the video. Thanks for watching. Man, I am absolutely exhausted. If I'm being honest, I don't think I ever properly recovered from my burnout doing the GTA 5 video. Despite my best efforts to relax and do some smaller videos to get me back in the swing of things, I still felt partially drained the last few months. Don't get me wrong, I haven't lost my passion for this at all, but it was starting to feel like it was taking me longer to get my videos done, even if I was hitting my goal of two a month. My scripts have taken longer to work on, partially because of writer's block, and also because I was driven to be more comprehensive and not just feel like I'm narrating the entire game to everyone. Trying my best to be more in-depth with my discussions of characters and story moments beyond just a surface-level observation. I'd like to think I've succeeded in some part in doing that, but there's always more room for improvement. I've also been trying to improve on my vocabulary, 
cracking open a thesaurus every now and then so I'm not repeating the same phrases over and over. Though I purposely avoid using too much flowery language, my approach to speaking is to keep it feeling natural and how I actually speak in casual conversations. Like I'm your buddy telling you about this sick new game I just discovered as opposed to sounding like I'm doing a book report for school. It's a hard balance between sounding relatable but also being comprehensive in my discussion, but I've been happy with it for the most part. Though I want to inject a little more of myself back into the scripts and sound less like your average game reviewer. I'm going to expand the type of games I cover, as while there's still plenty to talk about in the world of open world crime sim GTA like games, I want to dip my toes into other genres too. The positive reception on the Walking Dead video has pushed me to look at the other season and other Telltale games. I'll probably take a look at The Wolf Among Us before I do season 2 of The Walking Dead though. If you saw my poll on my community page, you know I want to start covering Final Fantasy games and it looks like the majority of you want me to talk about Final Fantasy VII first. Which, admittedly, I'm probably biting off way more than I can chew by discussing what many still consider the best Final Fantasy game, if not the best game of all time. More so because the game has been talked about to death at this point, but I'm eager to take the challenge, especially because I don't have the same attachment to the game that other fans do. And honestly, I really like the direction that remake is going in. Don't worry, I'm not going to come in with a contrarian point of view trying to act like it's overrated. I absolutely agree that it's an amazing game, it's just not my favorite Final Fantasy, or even the best in my opinion. That's Final Fantasy X. I won't say when I'll do the video on it, I want to take a slightly different approach than I usually do, but also want to avoid doing a bog standard review too. I'll need time to think about how I want to do it and want to give myself plenty of time to work on it, but I'm hoping the result will be enjoyable. If it works out, I'll use it as the template for future Final Fantasy and RPG related videos. So it better get hundreds of thousands of views and likes or no Final Fantasy X review for you guys. Just kidding, obviously. Going back to the stuff that falls more into my normal content, I'll move on to Mafia 2 soon. I think I'm ready to jump into talking about Hitman. I'll probably go with Blood Money since it was the first one I played in the series. And dive back into GTA, covering the original two games and GTA Advance. And of course I'll be talking about GTA 6 too. I just need more trailers to drop that give me more to discuss outside of the graphics. I also want to do Max Payne. It's another game that's been discussed and analyzed to death, but I think my reviewing style will be enough to bring something different to the table. R.I.P. James McCaffrey. I want to finally play The Darkness, do something on Blood Rain and The Suffering, and of course return to Rockstar Games Library and cover Red Dead Redemption. Hell, maybe I'll go back to Pokemon. I really want to do a video on Gold and Silver. So I have a lot of ideas for 2024, and I'll try to find a nice balance of content that will get all of you interested. I can confidently say that 2023 was an amazing year for me. I'd go as far as saying it's the best year I've had in like a decade. Not just because of how much the channel has grown, but in my personal life as well. For the longest time I felt like I was just going through the motions, never feeling particularly ambitious or with any real goal in mind. I just kind of figured I'd move from job to job and that'd be it. Find something stable that pays the bills, but not really fulfilling. But then the channel started to take off and suddenly I had something I was passionate about. Hard work actually felt fulfilling now, and was paying off. I've said it before, but I can really see a future in becoming a full-time YouTuber. I'm going to wait until I'm absolutely ready, but I'm hoping to make that leap next year. I know AdSense can be unreliable, so I'll finally get around to doing a Patreon and fleshing out the membership options more. I think I'm going to add the option to watch videos early and uncensored to make YouTube memberships more enticing. Also, I'm going to try and finally commit to streaming next year too. Part of the reason I haven't is because it's pretty crowded in my house, so it could be tough to stream without being interrupted. I think I'll try streaming late at night on weekends, like after 10pm or something, and see how that works out. For the most part, it'll be chill streams of me playing games I've already covered for the channel, or collecting footage for upcoming videos. As more GTA 6 news trickles in and more trailers drops, maybe I'll do some streams discussing my thoughts on what's shown, and what I want out of the game. Oh, and I'm going to do it here on YouTube and not Twitch. Rather keep everything on one platform and not make you guys sub to me on another website. Random question, but what do you consider the best video I've done? Might be a not their choice, but for me, I think it's the Mafia video. It really pushed me to try something different and compare two different versions of the same game measuring each of their strengths and weaknesses. Second place is probably The Walking Dead. Since the point and click mechanics are so simple, the video was strictly focused on the story and characters. I had to slow things down, understand what the story was going for, 
analyze the characters, and understand their various point of views. I like the way I do videos. I feel it suits me perfectly. But there's always room for improvement, and I think I can use that style to review games without feeling like I'm just narrating or bloating the runtime. And I guess that's it. I'm going to take a few weeks off to properly rest and catch up on my backlog of games. Might be able to finish Phantom Liberty and sink some decent time into Baldur's Gate 3. Huge thanks for getting the channel to over 55k subscribers. And for helping San Andreas become my first video with a million views on it. Hopefully it'll be the first of more to come. GTA 4 is getting kind of close, so if you guys want to watch that while I'm gone, that'd be great. Keep an eye on my community tab for any updates or to see whatever I'm playing. Follow me on my Instagram too if you like. I'm going to try and be more active on it again. And check out whatever video of mine that gets recommended here at the end. Have a happy new year, and I'll see you guys in 2024. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.